Among the earliest and sharpest critics of the New Conservatives in the 1950s had been a, a group of liberal social scientists centred at Berkeley, Harvard and Columbia universities, including Daniel Bell, Nathan Glazer, Samuel Huntington and Daniel Patrick Moynihan. In the 1960s, however, many of them, reacting to the decade's social turbulence, began to fear for the stability and governability of their society and began to criticise the far-reaching government programmes of President Johnson's Great Society. In 1965, Bell and Irving Kristol published a new journal, The Public Interest, dedicated to such practical policy questions as urban renewal, law and order, education and racial politics. Before long, they and their contributors noticed a strong moral element in their ostensibly neutral analysis and admitted that they were implicitly arguing for the traditional virtues. Although many of them had grown up on the political left, they gradually became known as the neoconservatives and for the most part accepted the label. Less tradition-oriented than most of the National Review group and more confident that government programmes can sometimes be benign, they nevertheless found themselves converging with their former antagonists, often to their own astonishment. Irving Kristol gave a catchphrase to the movement with his declaration, a neoconservative is a liberal who has been mugged by reality. Well, some early history. Daniel Bell's anthology, The New American Right, had been published in 1955, and it was the most concentrated attack on the new conservatives in the 1950s. It appeared in the same year as National Review. It used models from social psychology to explain the conservatives' conduct, rather than engaging in an analysis of their ideas. In other words, it treated them as though they represented a kind of pathology to be diagnosed, rather than an intellectual and political movement to be debated. One of the principal ideas of this anthology was the idea of status anxiety. The idea was that when a group's status declines, members of the group look for scapegoats and demonise them. Hence, said these liberal intellectuals, the Conservatives' passionate anti-communism. It isn't that they really hate communism that much, it's that it's a displaced way of expressing their anxiety over their declining status in society. Now, these liberal intellectuals were also anti-communists, but they thought that their version of it was much more rational and intellectual, and was in fact the exact antithesis of McCarthyism. They hated McCarthy because they thought he was a reckless anti-communist who was undermining an essentially necessary job. At its worst, or at its bluntest, the work of these social scientists insinuated a continuity between European fascism and American conservatism. This generation of sociologists was heavily influenced by Theodore Adorno's book, The Authoritarian Personality. Adorno, himself an émigré from the Frankfurt School, argued that people who were left rootless and isolated by the rise of modern civilization longed for strong leadership, and that it was these deracinated people, these uprooted men, who'd been ready recruits to Italian fascism and German Nazism in the 1930s. And now the allegation was that the American right of the 1950s was working in the same way. One of the contributors to Daniel Bell's anthology was Richard Hofstadter. He described the Conservatives' approach to politics as part of the paranoid style, and he dismissed them as pseudo-conservatives, alleging that there was nothing truly conservative about them at all. Now, Richard Hofstadter was the preeminent historian of his generation, a professor at Columbia University and a very brilliant man. But this was much the worst of his scholarship, a thinly veiled attack in which he placed the new conservatives in the lineage of the great lunatics of American history. Now, the new conservatives gave as good as they got. Russell Kirk and William Buckley, as they uh, encountered criticism like this, answered that these liberal critics had made no attempt to assess conservative ideas. They said, if anyone needs to be subjected to clinical psychology, it was the liberals for their failure to take the threat of communism and government gigantism seriously enough. So this is a period of mutual mudslinging, a very unpromising beginning 
to what was later going to, de to develop into a friendly relationship. The liberal social scientists were unnerved by the social upheavals of the 1960s and they began to fear that America was becoming ungovernable. They were proud of the fact that in the 1950s they'd resisted McCarthyism and they were not accustomed to being attacked from the left. In their view, their finest hour had been standing up to McCarthy, a demagogue of the right, and bravely holding on to a sort of middle left position. But suddenly, in the 1960s, they found that they were being attacked from the left, which to them was an unfamiliar experience. The new left, that is the student movement, regarded liberal professors as, antagon as antagonists. After all, the students said, these professors are cooperating with a system that is alienating and is irrelevant to the lives we now live. The liberal cult of expertise in the Kennedy and Johnson administrations, which the liberal professors were very proud of, is exactly what the new left was against. The student movement claimed that these professors were unwittingly supporting the military industrial complex and that it was they that were dragging America into Vietnam and, uh, deter and uh, causing society to deteriorate rather than rescuing it. By the mid-1960s, many of them had risen to, to senior academic positions and they often suffered the brunt of student criticism in the campus uprisings. Samuel Huntington, who was a professor of politics at Harvard University, speculated about the destabilizing character of too much political involvement. This was in direct contradiction to the idea, which has long been familiar in American society, that all citizens should take an interest in politics. Um, every citizenship class of the 20th century had said, of course you should exercise your right to vote and take an interest in politics. Now Huntington started to, to raise the opposite possibility. We've got too much politicization now in the 60s. In fact, the new left openly favored what it called participatory democracy. Let's get more people involved in politics. Huntington raised the, raised the opposite possibility. What we need is fewer people interested in politics. He developed arguments for the benefits of political passivity. He said, if, uh, if everybody votes, and if the election is close, suppose that the candidate who wins, wins with 51% of the vote and the loser gets 49. That means that 49% of the people actually voted against what they now have to live with. They're likely to be more agitated and more resentful than if they hadn't bothered voting at all. Huntington said, if we have low voter turnout of 35 or 40%, that doesn't particularly matter. Because what it demonstrates isn't that the people are indifferent, but that by and large they're moderately content and are happy to live with whoever might win the election. Now, of course, this is looking at politics from the point of view of the government and from the point of view of law and order. Like all the developing neoconservatives, he was emphasizing that government is for the specialists. It's the absolute antithesis of populism. Daniel Bell, who I've already mentioned, and Irving Kristol, launched a new journal called The Public Interest in 1965. And it was ostensibly a non-ideological policy journal. Both men were part of a group which is now remembered as the New York Intellectuals, a group about which many great books have been written. Most of them were Jewish, most of them came from the New York area, and most of them were leftists. Usually they were the sons or grandsons of Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe. But they also included a smattering of other very interesting people, such as the literary critic Edmund Wilson, perhaps the most famous American critic of the 20th century, and the novelist Mary McCarthy. Irving Kristol had been a Trotskyist at the City College of New York in the 1930s, before World War II. And in those days, he'd been an avid reader of the Partisan Review, the era's premier intellectual journal of the intellectual left. Now, Partisan Review had been a Trotskyist journal, and Irving Kristol himself had identified with the Trotskyists. That is to say, people of the far left, but passionate adversaries of Stalinism, the, the, the orthodoxy of the Soviet Union. And in fact, oddly, being a Trotskyist was in some ways very good preparation for being a Cold War anti-communist, because it meant that over years of, of, of polemical infighting, you'd learned about the mendacity of Soviet communism as represented by Stalin up close. 
After the Second World War, after his phase of military service, Irving Kristol had become the editor of Encounter magazine, the Anglo-American journal of the Congress for Cultural Freedom. This was a journal um, published by liberals on both sides of the Atlantic, um, expressing the ideas of, of cultural freedom over against the cultural repressiveness of the Soviet Union. Later on, it turned out that the journal, like most journals, made a loss, but had been funded by the CIA. In other words, it was actually uh, a propaganda wing of the American government. Crystal's partner, Daniel Bell, was a brilliant journalist who'd been lured into academic life in 1959 by Columbia University and then was poached from Columbia to Harvard in 1969, even though Bell had never written a doctoral dissertation or been to a conventional graduate school. He was regarded as too good to need to go through that credentialing process. He was the author of a very influential book, The End of Ideology, published in 1960, which carried the idea that pragmatism should now replace the destructive ideological passions of the early 20th century. His idea was, we've, it's now time for us to get beyond the, the communist and anti-communist polemics and instead to start looking as social scientists very pr practically in a, in a down-to-earth way at what's actually going on, to measure it statistically and to draw our conclusions about urban policy, for example, on the basis of these findings, leaving out as much ideology as, as they possibly could. Public Interest, their new journal, was not so scintillating or so dazzling as the great polemics of partisan review, and it was meant to be more useful and less dangerous. In the inaugural editorial, Bell and Crystal even said that theirs was a middle-aged magazine for middle-aged readers. Its contributors emphasised accurate, statistically informed studies of urban and social problems, and they tried to offer practical solutions. Now, two other very influential sociologists of the period, Daniel Patrick Moynihan and Nathan Glazer, had shown in their book Beyond the Melting Pot, published in 1963, that ethnic groups do not disappear in America. From the time of the early 20th century, a period of high immigration, the theory, the hope had been that America represented a great melting pot. This was actually the name of a play by Israel Zangwill, written in the first decade of the 20th century. People come in from all over the world, but they and their children and their grandchildren learn English, become striving, good, hard-working, upright American citizens, and leave behind the material they brought with them from the old world. But in Beyond the Melting Pot, published in 63, Moynihan and Glazer said there was a close study of the ethnic districts of New York City, and they said, these ethnic groups don't disappear in America. It's true that they, they learn to speak English. It's true that they adapt to the American uh, ethos and the possibility of, uh, of upward social mobility. But in fact, neighborhoods are very tight. Uh, New York still has Irish neighborhoods and Italian ones and Puerto Rican ones and Polish ones and so on. And jobs are often passed down through the family from father to son. There's still a high level of, of um, marriage within the ethnic group and so on. This discovery had implications for American racial policy after the civil rights movement. After all, the idea of Martin Luther King in the early days of the civil rights movement had been to create a colorblind society. But sociologists like Moynihan and Glazer said, that's delusional. We can't possibly get rid of awareness of ethnic or racial difference. Ethnic groups don't melt, and neither do racial groups. A fully desegregated society, the aim of new programs like busing, which also began in the 1960s, ignores the evidence of the persistence of group behavior. Moynihan then got a job in the federal government working for the Johnson administration, and the report he wrote on African-American families in 1965 caused a great furore and contributed to Moynihan's alienation from the mainstream of American liberalism. He had the job of Assistant Secretary of Labor in the, in the Johnson administration. And he wrote an internal memorandum called The Negro Family, The Case for National Action. In it he wrote that the Negro family in uh, American cities was, quote, a tangle of pathologies. In particular, he pointed to the fact that many African American men, young men, had poor male role models. Very often father was absent. 
Very often they were brought up by mothers or grandmothers in matriarchal families. Moynihan wrote that a great deal of remedial legislation was needed in addition to the removal of discrimination laws. Well, the report was widely, was widely admired within the administration, but then it was leaked and it proved to be highly abrasive to Black Pride, the new movement of the mid-1960s, which was rising to displace the, the harmonious rhetoric of King's generation. Black and white liberal reviewers said that Moynihan was blaming the victim and understating the impact of racism and segregation by blaming the black family instead. Moynihan himself wrote a devastating rebuttal to these criticisms, but the incident soured him on great society liberalism. As I mentioned in the previous lecture, there were terrible urban riots in 1966 and 67, particularly in the black district of inner cities like Detroit. Moynihan said that liberals should stop, quote, should stop defending and explaining away anything, however outrageous, which Negroes individually and collectively might do. And he added that they should also realize that their concern for preserving order now made them logical allies with conservatives. In a speech of 1967, Moynihan said, Liberals must see more clearly that their essential interest is in the stability of the social order. And given the present threats to stability, they must seek out and make much more effective alliances with political conservatives who share their interest. Well, no wonder that conservatives like Buckley and Frank Mayer were beginning to regard Moynihan as a potential convert to their own point of view. Buckley wrote in October 1967 that Moynihan, quote, is saying some of the most interesting things being said these days in public life. Most strikingly, that liberals have a good deal to learn from conservatives. Anything we conservatives can do to help, just holler. You know, the beginnings of a reconciliation. Nathan Glazer, and other contributors to the public interest began to criticise affirmative action programmes which were being introduced by the Great Society. They said that the problem with affirmative action is that it substitutes group rights for individual rights. It no longer matters so much who you are as what group you belong to. Affirmative action imposes quotas and timetables which makes the actual hiring of the most suitable people for the job unlikely. And besides, enforcing affirmative action creates a costly and often inflexible bureaucracy, which, once it's in place, is going to be very, very difficult indeed ever to get rid of. It's going to strengthen government and strengthen uh, the number of bureaucrats who have to be supported by taxation. And, said Glazer, affirmative action doesn't actually benefit the inner city poor. Rather, it, it, it most benefits minorities who are upwardly mobile anyway, African Americans living in the suburbs who are much more likely to get these kinds of jobs and would have had them anyway. But now, affirmative action was creating permanent bureaucratic categories into which everybody had to be squeezed. He could even foresee that there would be African American opponents of affirmative action who would say, affirmative action casts doubt on the legitimate achievements of people who benefit from them. In other words, if you're a very talented uh, African-American and you get a job and do it well, nevertheless, you're going to be vulnerable to the insinuation that you only got the job because of your race. It's going to be abrasive to your pride to be a beneficiary of it. And, of course, affirmative action creates bitter resentment and backlash among excluded whites who are going to feel that they would have had these jobs had it not been for affirmative action. So bit by bit, Glazer and some of his other associates at Public Interest built up uh, an indictment of affirmative action. One of the most distinctive books of the new neoconservatism was Edward Banfield's book, The Unheavenly City, published in 1970. It won widespread praise from conservatives for its harsh summary of inner city problems. The key idea in Banfield's book was that the idea of the underclass. He said, they're only about 5% of the urban population, but these are the ones who cause nearly all urban problems. Why? Because they lack an orientation towards the future. They can't think ahead. They're unable to hold down steady jobs, they're sexually promiscuous, and they exhibit what he called a pre-conventional morality. The riots of the 60s um, 
Banfield, after studying them, said that they were not political rebellions. Some people on the, on the, on the left had theorised that the riots were latently political rebellions. Banfield says, no, it was rioting for fun and profit. That's the name of one of his chapters. He said, when you see that uh, the rioters are carrying away televisions from store windows that they've smashed, there's nothing political about it. They simply want to have TVs and they've got the opportunity now to get them. One of Banfield's proposals, uh, which seemed outrageous to many of his critics, was we should discuss urban situa the, ur the urban situation less. Because the more we discuss it, the more we raise expectations and hopes that can't possibly be met. We're raising false hopes. Most of these urban problems are never going to disappear. On the other hand, urban life over the last century has become steadily better over the decades. People are healthier, they live longer, the water supply is better, the medical help is better, the education is better and so on. But that doesn't mean that we're going to ever have a utopia. We're not. We're going to continue to have problems. Well, this kind of resigned attitude was, was itself a shock to liberals of the 60s, the activists and optimists who believed that these problems could be made to go away by benevolent government work. And of course, it's a, it's a book and a remark resonant with conservative wisdom. Banfield, like many other conservative writers, such as Whitt Whittaker Chambers, was convinced that his ideas were not going to be listened to and that he was actually joining the losing side of history. Another very important uh, recruit to this new ne the, to neoconservatism, this new outlook, was Norman Podhoretz, the editor of Commentary magazine. He'd been a precocious student of literature. He'd studied with Lionel Trilling at Columbia, the first uh, Jewish professor of English literature at Columbia. And then he'd gone to Cambridge in England and studied with F.R. Leavis, one of the giants of literary criticism in the 20th century. As a young man, he became the editor of Commentary magazine, the journal of the American Jewish Committee. In the 50s, he promoted radical new literature, the work of Norman Mailer. But he became disenchanted in the 1960s, and his disenchantment began with a famous essay called My Negro Problem and Ours, from 1963. It was a denunciation of liberal pieties about race, and it described the racial bitterness he'd felt in his childhood as a Jewish kid in a neighbourhood, half of which was black. He said he'd envied the black kids, but he'd hated them too. And he ended the essay by saying that he continued to feel that way, to fear them and to envy them and to hate them still. But now, because he was a liberal, he was also made to feel guilty about it. He said, the civil rights movement has gravely underestimated the power of racial feeling in this country and that racial feeling was going to persist unless miscegenation could, over the long run, make the races themselves disappear. Podhoretz's next controversial step was the writing of an autobiography when he was still a very young man called Making It, published in 1967. He was still in his 30s. This autobiography was uh, written in the same kind of relentlessly honest tone as his, uh, his essay about his Negro problem, as he called it. It rejected the counterculture and it also rejected the highbrow cult of literary alienation. Uh, many of Podhoretz's friends were writers who, who liked the idea that the, they were alienated from mainstream society and that they didn't have the same success goals as most of their contemporaries. But Podhoretz defiantly declared, it's better to be rich than poor, it's better to be respected than ignored, it's better to be successful than a failure. He said he was determined to enjoy his success and he wasn't going to feel ashamed of it. And he said, most intellectuals are hypocrites because they want to be successful, but they pretend they don't. Now, the tone of voice of Making It, which is in fact a very entertaining book to read, sounded relentlessly boastful to many of its readers. In fact, friends of his who'd read it before publication warned him not to publish it, warned him that he was going to destroy or damage his reputation. Sure enough, when he ignored them and brought it out, merciless reviews ensued, estranging him from many friends, particularly on the left. And perhaps partly in reaction to this uh, stinging uh, rejection, from about 1970 onwards, Commentary magazine began to assault all aspects of the left and the counterculture. Podhoretz had a strong tendency to find sinister analogies between the new left, the new student left, and the old communists. He made ruthless criticisms of the Black Panthers, of the new feminists, of student activism of the George McGovern movement. George McGovern was the Democratic candidate in 1972. 
And he regarded liberalism as having betrayed the best in its own tradition, especially its tough-minded anti-communism. Now, he said, revulsion against the Vietnam, the Vietnam War had gone too far and led to a repudiation of anti-communism itself, whereas, in fact, communism remained a severe threat. Among the neoconservatives' most distinctive ideas was the concept of the new class, the law of unintended consequences, and the theory of mediating institutions. The new class, according to this theory, thrives in a bureaucracy and is sentimentally attached to the adversary culture rather than to the values of the bourgeois middle class. Now, the new class, as the neoconservatives describe it, is not a class in the Marxist sense. In other words, it's not derived from a group's relationship to the means of production. It's rather derived from their relationship to government. The new class are the people who administer the massive new government programs of the great society and the vast new professoriate. They're sceptical of the market economy and they hold a direct interest in the expansion of big government. In other words, even though they claim to be objective and disinterested, they're not, because as the bureaucracy thrives, so do they. The neoconservatives said, the new class has got one set of interests, and the business class, which at a glance might seem to be similar to them, has got a different set. The law of unintended consequences was a second of these new ideas. It codified the idea that the most ambitious government programs will have the most unexpected consequences, many of them malignant. They often quoted the example of the uh, aid to families with dependent children, another of the new of the great society programs. They said, the intention of AFDC was clearly benign. The idea was to prevent the suffering of children whose mothers weren't married to make sure that they didn't suffer from malnutrition or neglect. But, they said, look at the, look at the unintended effect of this program. It's now created an incentive to young women to have babies and to not marry. Because if they marry, they don't get the money from the government. Uh, and if they don't have the baby, they don't get the money. What they need is to have the baby and to be not married. Then they become pensioners of the government. So family breakdown actually becomes a worse problem rather than a diminishing one. It's an unforeseen consequence and one which perhaps was impossible to foresee before the program was in introduced. But the fact that every social pro problem, every social program always has unforeseen consequences ought to make us very cautious in introducing such programs. Peter Berger, Richard Newhouse and Michael Novak and some other neoconservatives developed also the idea of mediating structures. This is another distinctive contribution to sociological theory from the neoconservatives or the popularising of these ideas. The idea of mediating structures is that there are valuable institutions which stand halfway between the individual and the state, generating, a health, uh, generating healthy individuals and a healthy society. They were catching on to an idea which had first been raised by Alexis de Tocqueville more than a hundred years previously. Berger and Newhouse, in their book To Empower People, The Role of Mediating Structures in Public Policy, published in 1977, said, the most important of all these structures is the family, but also the church or the synagogue, the social club, the social gathering, the local committee, the great array of cooperating organisations at every level of society, through membership of which individuals learn how to relate to the wider world, bit by bit, as they grow. Government should realise that these mediating institutions create a strong society, and, and, and government should do everything it can to let them thrive, not undermine them. Now, this was all part of the argument against busing and against affirmative action, and in favour of things like school vouchers, because all these policies will strengthen families' sense of control over their destiny and the integrity of their neighbourhoods. Busing in particular, the idea of uh, what, what was so dismaying about busing to many neoconservatives was it shatters the neighbourhood because it's redistributing the kids and taking the sense of neighbourhood identity away from education. Michael Novak wrote a book called The Rise of the Unmeltable Ethnics in 1972 on themes similar to those voiced a decade earlier in Beyond the Melting Pot. Novak says, it's good to have these layers of identity in the mediating institutions from which we learn how to act responsibly and develop loyalties. Nobody wants to be just an individual. We all need denser forms of self-identification. And he goes on to say that the residual ethnic group is one of those forms. 
This is a book full of swipes at the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant way of life, the WASPs, and the way in which, says Novak, the WASP culture universalises its claims. It's a characteristic book of the neoconservatives, many of whom were Jews and Catholics. On behalf of his Slavic ancestors, Novak took offence against the WASPs. He says, Immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe had to learn order, discipline, neatness, cleanliness, reserve. They had to learn to modulate emotion, to control passion, to hold their hands still, to hold the muscles of their face placid, to find food and body odors offensive, to quieten their voices, to present themselves as coolly reasonable. In other words, the implication there is that uh, living in a wasp society has had a terrible psychological, it's been an ordeal for ethnic people. Now, Novak, like Berger and Newhouse, was emphasising that the opponents of busing weren't necessarily racists, but rather that they were defenders of the neighbourhood tradition, and that then the neighbourhood tradition was very much deserving of, defen of defence. Ironically, all these movements, the new ethnic pride movement of the early 70s, was itself an outgrowth of the black pride movement of the 1960s, but Novak gave them a sharply conservative flavour and insisted that each group deserved the same kind of respect. Well, perhaps the most crucial breakthrough for the ex-radical neoconservatives was to recognise that capitalism itself might be the best available economic system for promoting the virtues they favoured. Irving Kristol wrote a book called Two Cheers for Capitalism in 1978. He says, capitalism self-interested, but it gets the job of economic growth done better than any other system. He was um, echoing a, a remark by E.M. Forster, two cheers for democracy. Democracy is not all that great, but it works. Capitalism distributes power rather than letting a, uh, a group of new class bureaucrats concentrate it. Small businesses are themselves family and community oriented and require the virtues necessary for social stability. Well, by the early 1980s, as we'll see in a future lecture, other neoconservative writers in the next stage of the movement were going to be giving not just two cheers for capitalism, but three.